Hey guys, it's me, Camille. And me, Tim. And so uh, we are just hanging out in the studio, uh, feeling kind of nostalgic, I think. Yeah, a little yeah. nostalgic. Because, you know, like we've been thinking about what we've done in the last couple of years mm-hmm. as we spend this time producing new shows for season four. And what do we do when we're feeling contemplative and we've got some extra time on our hands? Oh, we procrastinate and we bring up videos of the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery. Because that's what people do, right? <laughs> Nerdy people. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, guys, don't pretend like you haven't done this either, because recently, as you've probably heard, there was the unveiling of the official portraits for Barack and Michelle Obama. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kim Sayet, director of the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery. So we're just going to kind of scroll through this uh, video. We've both seen this a couple of times. Um, and so here's the part where uh, renowned painter Kehinde Wiley and former President Barack Obama pulled down the veil to the official portrait, like a big climatic moment. So Obama spends a fair amount of his speech talking about the artist and the deep meaning behind his work. See, Wiley often paints young people of color as European kings and queens, challenging narratives about power and privilege. But the former president did have to negotiate a few things with Wiley. Maybe the one area where there were some concessions uh, was, as I said before, Kehinde's art often takes ordinary people and, and elevates them, lifts them up, and, and puts them in these fairly elaborate settings. And so his initial impulse maybe in the work was to also elevate me and put me in these settings with you know, partridges and scepters and <laughs> thrones and shift robes and uh, <laughs> mounting me on horses. <laughs> and I had to explain that I've got enough political problems without <laughs> you making me look like Napoleon. We've got to bring it down just a touch. So Obama's a, a funny guy. Uh, turns out Wiley's kind of a funny guy, too. And when he gets to the podium, he kind of fires back. So how do you explain that a lot of that is just simply not true? <laughs> In Obama's official painting, which if you haven't seen it by now, just Google it quick. Uh, Obama's seated in a chair with a calm and determined look on his face, and surrounding him is lush green foliage and flowers. There's the chrysanthemum, uh, which is a sort of state flower of Chicago, uh, Illinois. There's uh, flowers that point towards Kenya. There's flowers that point towards Hawaii. In a very symbolic way, what I'm doing is charting his path on Earth through those plants that sort of weave their way There's a fight going on between he and the foreground and then the plants that are sort of trying to announce themselves underneath his feet. Who gets to be the star of the show, the story or the man who inhabits that story? Earlier in his speech, Wiley talks about how when he was growing up in Los Angeles, he didn't see many paintings like this on gallery walls. Uh, There weren't too many people who happened to look like me in those museums, on those walls. So as the years go on and as I try to create my own type of work, uh, it had to do with correcting for some of that, uh, trying to fa- find places where people who happen to look like me uh, do feel accepted or uh, do have the ability to express their state of grace on the grand narrative scale of museum space. So the whole ceremony is, it's just like really uplifting. It's a very, very cool thing to see. So you go go watch the whole thing after you're done listening to this Yeah, podcast. yeah. We're going to post it on our website, <laughs> we should say. We're going to post it on our website, welivehere.show. Yeah, because you, my cross you especially, you especially yeah. want to see the unveiling of Michelle Obama's portrait, which is, is also pretty cool. Um, but this is what we meant by being nostalgic, because months ago, Wiley was actually part of an episode we did on controversy at the Contemporary Art Museum here in St. Louis. Um, There are just like a lot of twists and turns and details in that particular uh, controversy, and you should just go ahead and scroll back 
through your feed when you're done listening to this and just refresh your memory of that because it's way more than we can get into right now. Yeah, the episode was called Museum Meltdown. Mm-hmm. But anyway, with the first black artist painting the official portrait of the first black president, we felt like it was time to maybe go back into our vault and mm-hmm. pull out some favorite parts of our interview with Wiley from uh, several wanted, months back, maybe, yeah, maybe, I maybe about a year ago. Something like that. And so anyways, the bottom line is like this is stuff that no one other than the people who produce the show have heard. No. So this is like... It's a super bonus time. Bonus. bonus. <laughs> so on today's episode, Kahende Wiley takes us all to Art Church. And from St. Louis Public Radio and PRX... This is We Live Here. We're a show for people somewhere on the woke spectrum. So before we officially open our vault, uh, just a quick little programming note. As you listen to this interview, you're going to hear a different voice. Uh, It's one of our former colleagues, uh, St. Louis Public Radio arts reporter Willis Ryder Arnold, asking the questions, and here's why. Yeah, that's how it works sometimes, Mm -hmm. guys. Willis had the connections to get to Wiley, which means he got to do the interview. Yeah. Uh, but, but we, we were, got to listen in. Yeah, we were on the other side of the glass listening in. And uh, as you can probably tell from the little bits that we played from you at the top of the show, Wiley has like a lot to say about white gatekeepers and art institutions. And how that limits the full understanding of the American experience especially after Willis asked the artist why it's so important to interject people of color into his style of painting. The style that I'm painting in uh, refers almost directly to the center of power in, in aesthetic terms to Europe. As an artist, everything that matters to me happens in Western European easel painting first. I studied painting from nine years old on and all of the major developments in the depiction of power, uh, the depiction of majesty and grace, come from Western Europe and come from the grand traditions of Western European easel painting. So the importance for me is, is I'm a fan of the work. I'm a fan of painting. And it makes a lot of sense for me to find a way that painting still matters in the 21st century. Uh, oftentimes, we look at museums as the site of the, uh, I would almost say, uh, uh, mm, cultural policing. Uh, What is it that we uh, demand to celebrate? What is it that we deem valuable enough for all the generations that are coming to be included into the canon? And for me, an artist like me, uh, that increasingly becomes people of color. That increasingly becomes people who've been on the periphery uh, of the center, in quotes, uh, people who haven't necessarily populated the grand museums throughout the world. Um, One of the ways in which your work is often described is heroic or situating people as heroic in your work. Can you tell me a little bit about why you find that an interesting term for your work and why you find it important when describing it? It's really important to talk about the heroic in my work because so much of the image of the black male in American society has to do with the pathetic, the downtrodden, the beleaguered, the socially maladroit. What I wanted to do was to really draw a psychological line between the pathetic and its opposite. There's a difference between what we receive in popular culture of black masculinity and this black body that I happen to occupy. And I've always recognized this cognitive and aesthetic dissonance between those two realities, the false reality that's presented in popular culture and the lived one that I inhabit. And I know with my brothers and cousins and fathers and uncles and all of the people who also occupy these very complex and spirited black and brown bodies. So the confusion between what we receive and what we want to see in art, in popular culture, has to be my subject matter. You said, like, even if you were to paint a bowl of fruit, no matter what, it would be read as a bowl of fruit painted by a black artist. Can you tell me a little bit about, like, your experience with that idea of context? Well, we started the conversation by saying that my study of human anatomy and my engagement with painting started with the white body. It started by painting white women in 
new drawing and painting classes. But later, as I continued making those types of work, I was being questioned as a black man as to why I was creating these images of the white female body. These types of assumptions were being placed upon me because of the color of my skin. There was a fascination with this young black man who was fetishizing the white female body. And there was an excitement around that. There was uh, the potentiality for a new body of work that can come out of this, a new investigation into white femininity seen from a black male perspective. That simply wasn't my project. My project was to learn the mechanics of painting. The material practice of painting involves duplication. It involves studying at the feet of all of those grand masters that you see in the museums throughout the world. And that involves copying the white body. It involves understanding how to materially create translucencies and blues that shine through pinks. And that's not incredibly easy to do. It's something that uh, it took me a long time to master. And, and quite reasonably, you could say that I paint the white body even more uh, elegantly than the black body. But through all of that learning, it also made me very aware of the absence of black and brown bodies in painting. It made me aware of the limitations to the vocabulary that we have as art practitioners, but it also made me very curious about the new possibilities that were at hand. As I began to explore flesh, the differences between tones, the different types of black and brownness and beigeness that can be celebrated in painting, it really opened up a, a whole new field of providence for me. I mean, guys, come on. Didn't we tell you listening to this man is like going to art church? Yeah, and luckily for us, the service is not over yet. We got to take a quick break, but when we come back, we hear what happens when an artist like Kahende Wiley takes this new energy around exploring and celebrating difference into primarily white spaces. When we left off with reporter Willis Ryder Arnold and artist Kahende Wiley, they were talking about how Wiley branched out from painting white bodies to those of black and brown ones. So you're doing this work at a time, you're doing this work at a very interesting time, and you're also doing this work in a series of institutions that are often dominated by white culture and actually feature primarily white gatekeepers. What does it feel like to be doing this work in that circumstance? It's a very important and exciting time to be alive as an artist. The term gatekeeper for an art professional means that you're pointing out new areas of excellence that can be celebrated by us as a society. In this increasingly darkened time where we find that the limits of pluralism and globalization are being questioned, I think it's really important for artistic professionals all over the place to, to re- uh, uh, to, to, to embrace again uh, these calls to arms that we've, in, that we've uh, prized for so many decades. The gains uh, that exist through making these types of choices are, are self-evident. The fact that when you have a Kehinde Wiley exhibition at any major museum in America, the numbers of black and brown faces, the numbers of white faces who've never felt either interested or invited to these institutions skyrockets. There's a sense in which people want high art to respond to real life without compromising on conceptual rigor. When you're looking at the broader art world, you're looking at the institutions of the gallery system, you're looking at the institutions of like schools of curation, you're looking at the museum institutions. What do you think is like the broad relationship of those institutions to the work of people of color? Well, increasingly what we're trying to do 
uh, as people of color and I think as white people of goodwill working within those institutions is to bear down and to tear down those that artificial dichotomy. I think that uh, as we do the good work of creating an America that we can all be proud of and stand by, we want to be able to say that these institutions simply and reflectively happen to look like us. And not just the sum of us, but, but all of us. And, and I think uh, at its best, what an institution, whether it be a museum or a literary journal or a film house, what we do at our best is we, we mobilized our best voices. And those best voices concentrate then on the communities that mean the most to them. And then we can sort of get the best of all of it. We get the most potent and uh, prescient points of view from all different corners, and those things happen to be who we are. This making America great again notion has to do with a pipe dream, a fantasy in which there was a holistic singular view of a single American identity. The fact is, is that we're fractured, and that fracture is a thing of beauty. That fracture is a collection of communities, a collection of desires, a collection of traditions that happen to create the soul of America. Her rhythm is not one, it's many, and we all dance to a different step. But in the end, it's the collection of those musics, it's the collection of those points of view that make us strong. And I'm not trying to put on airs with the work, I'm trying to talk about the real, actual uh, world that I both recognize and rub up against uh, in the day to day. But what I am doing is I'm using that vocabulary and the trappings of all of the polite society uh, to the service of people who haven't necessarily been treated that way. There's nothing polite about exclusion, but I hopefully have created in my work a very nuanced and polite way of saying, yes, you're welcomed into the, the, the walls of a museum, you're welcome into my studio, and you're welcome to be seen. Okay, do y'all have praise hands up? Because we do. Yeah, I just don't really get tired of listening to that man talk. Yeah, and in actuality, we may get a chance to talk with him again, or at the very least, see his work up close in person. Because Wiley is coming to St. Louis. Woo! Yeah. So exciting. Uh, so, guys, late last year, the St. Louis Art Museum announced an exhibit of Wiley's work. And in fact, to prepare, he actually came to town and his team took pictures of area residents. Wiley has said that those images will inspire the paintings and sculptures at his show, which launches in October. I mean, how cool. It's pretty is awesome. It? He's so <laughs> it's pretty excited. Cool. Yeah, I know. I cannot wait. Yeah. Anyway, guys, we got to get back into the lab and continue to crank out some new shows for you for season four. But we hope you enjoyed this little bonus episode as much as we did. All right, so let's uh, let's pass around the collection plates now that we've been to Now's the church. Now's the time. <laughs> we are taking this church metaphor let's way, just get out way of the way. too far. Yeah, let's just roll, <laughs> roll credits. Um, so a very special thank you to associate producer Alana Sistrunk for helping us immensely put together this episode. Yes, that's a new name, but one you guys will be hearing mm-hmm. more and more mm-hmm. often. Thank you, Alana. Yes. Uh, what do we say? We Live Here is produced by me, Camille Stanley. And me, Tim Lloyd. And from St. Louis Public Radio on PRX. PRX. We are rusty, folks. Oh, gosh. Let's do it again. We Live Here is produced by me, Camille Stanley. And me, Tim Lloyd. And from St. Louis Public Radio on PRX. This is We Live Here. Support for this podcast comes from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.